Molly really doesn't need an introduction. Uh, you guys know her well. She's a tremendous blessing to our church, a tremendous blessing to us as musicians, certainly to me personally. You know, we live in an age of hymnody. Molly introduced that word to us this morning, right? Of new hymns that we have the ability when the new hymn is written, um, we can sing it within weeks. Whereas there was a time when the only way to sing a new hymn is that there was a new hymn book published. So because of that time, you would go many, 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 many years, sometimes a decade or more before you would learn a new hymn. Um, but with the advent of the internet and, and certainly with the pro proliferation of hymn writers, we have the ability to introduce a lot of new hymns that are well written. And I want you to know when you get a hymn sheet like you got this morning, um, that usually doesn't come from the publisher, maybe, but it never comes from the publisher. Um, often someone will send me a hymn that they like. Uh, Cassie sang a new hymn last week. But what you get in your hands, Molly writes that for us. So there's a lot of things that we see every week as a blessing at our church, kind of behind the scenes. Um, all the orchestrations that the orchestra plays every week, Molly writes all those. So that's not something that we're, we're able to purchase, but she writes those really tailored for our church at Faith Baptist Church. She knows the musicians. She knows the instrumentation that we have, and um, often, not every week, but often, uh, she's writing a new orchestration. Um, we did a brand new this one this morning. What was the song that we did it for? Christ of Wisdom. There was another one, too, a new orchestration. So Only a Holy God, that orchestration that you heard for Only a Holy God, that was the first time that we had ever done that particular orchestration, and Molly wrote that this week, and we sat down as an orchestra and we played that. So there's a lot of things behind the scenes that Molly does that are a blessing to us uh, week in and week out. She spends many hours in the office writing and uh, just as a, as a blessing to all of us as pastors, to us as a church family, certainly to me personally. And we're committed to new hymnody, but we're also committed to the hymnody that's been in our hymn books for many, many years, and some hymns that have been written um, many years ago that are not in our hymn book. And so we, we, we really seek to strike a balance there. And I'm excited to learn some things about some of the hymns that we've been singing, that I've been singing my entire life, that um, I'm not even familiar with, I'm sure. So Molly spent time in England. I was jealous uh, when I heard about the trip that she had. And uh, perhaps I would like to do that, something like that someday. She did tell me that after, what, 12 days, she'd seen enough gravesides. Um, and she was ready to come back, all right? So, but she'll share a lot of that with us tonight. I, I just want to say, as a church, Molly, thank you for your ministry that you're going to have tonight. And uh, for every week, we are, we are blessed by the gifts that God's given her, that she's committed uh, to local church ministry here at Faith. So, Molly, come and minister, please. Well, it is a joy to do this. I think this might be maybe making faith history. <laughs> I thought about this before. I, I don't know if ever I've seen a, a female do an entire service. So I, I really do feel this is privileged. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I asked myself, why am I chasing all these gravestones and dead people? <laughs> Halfway through the trip, uh, when I was sleeping on the floor in different places, I, I, I cried and I thought, I don't think I wanna do this again. <laughs> But there was something compelling me forward because I really did feel like this was such a gift and I don't wanna get ahead of myself, but um, since Pastor Jim's already kind of covered my entire final page, <laughs> thank you for that. Anyway, um, I am grateful for this opportunity. Uh, I wanna also say I was away for several Sundays this spring and I wanna thank the people who covered for me when I was gone. That is, this, there's a lot of pressure up here and I, I enjoy it every week. It's what I believe I'm called to do. But to Jill and Laura especially, um, thank you for covering and for doing it so well and for Pastor Jim. Um, there are no words to describe our partnership as in ministry. I would get um, teary if I talked about it. He's a joy to work with, um, to, to elaborate on the behind the scenes. Normally he will um, plan sometime early in the week, hopefully. <laughs> and then we talk about it and it's just kind of an ongoing dialogue. And then it's just a, just a real privilege. Um, what I feel like my job is for our church is to present hymns beautifully to you. And sometimes, you know, there's, there's, little, there's different styles in this world and I feel like faith has a culture here. And I'm privileged to just help set that for you. And hopefully it's, you know, as beautiful as it can be. I mean, it's, there were, there's always room for improvement, but um, our orchestra is really good at this too. I, I give them new music and they say, okay, this should be changed. We need new markings. And they're just very good at adapting. So I appreciate that. <clears throat> so to get on with this, so the history of English hymnody, 
this is really, to me, this is just, this is the budding era of the English-speaking hymnody. That's why I, word, I, I gave the word English, because hymnody didn't start with English speakers. It started in the Bible. And so I really do feel like it's, it's um, probably appropriate if we rewind time a little bit and go back to where it, congregational song started right in the first place. So I'll give you the map of where we were. Some of you have been to England before. I had um, I spent time with the Gearhearts. They were there in Wales and England. Oxford is really the center of our, where our location was. We landed in London, <clears throat> and we ended in London. We did kind of a circle of about 1,000 miles and chased a lot of monuments, as I told you this morning. And so we kind of did a, a little, just a tour and, 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 and saw all these places. Sometimes we were in three or four cities a day, and then we would stop and drive back to our, wherever our hotel was. So it was, it was quite a trip. It was, it was a lot of information. I brought my laptop with me, and I would get in the car as soon as we'd, um, we'd exit one of our cemeteries, and I'd write all this stuff down because there's just no way to remember it all, but it's just, it was such a gift to do. So here we go. For context, <clears throat> this is a historical timeline, I think we do need to start with where did congregational song start in the very beginning? So I'm going to put you to the test class. Here we go. Biblical congregational song. I want you to think about the first time we know congregational song happened in the Bible. Okay? So think about this. This is I'm going to give you a hint. It is not in the New Testament. We know of songs. We know of occasions where people sang and they noted it in Scripture. But where did it first happen in the Bible? And can you tell me where and where it was, at least what the context was? I'm hearing, ex do I hear Exodus? Okay, Exodus, yes, thank you. Exodus 15, this is the song of Miriam and Moses. Now, I've, sometimes it's quoted as the song of Miriam, and then I read that it was the song of Moses, so I just put them together. And Miriam, I will say this, my name is actually, um, Molly is actually a derivative of Mary, and so is Miriam, so I've always kind of felt a connection to her. <laughs> I don't know, that's funny. Anyway, so <laughs> moving on, little anecdotes about me. So here are more places where we know song happened in the Bible. Psalms, obviously, an entire book, entire book of Song of Solomon, the song, I mean, if you ever thought, it says the Song of Solomon. The next one to me is one of the most precious places, of course, because of the context, is Christ and his disciples after the Last Supper. I don't believe that was the only time they sang together because they were so familiar with singing, but it was probably one of the most sobering moments of song. And then, of course, the Song of the Redeemed in Revelation. So then we have, we're moving forward with the early church, Greek congregational song. And the most famous song from this era is co called the Gloria Patri, which is basically a doxology. And I knew Damien would know this. Is there anyone who's grown up on singing the Gloria Patri? And you know it in Latin or you know it in English. Yes, a few people. My dad grew up Lutheran. Part of this was part of their liturgy. They actually learned catechisms and this was part of what they learned. And we actually sung this several times in England. They had what's called even song. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's, it's kind of a, a community um, worship event. Um, nothing like we would have here in a local church context, but very interesting to kind of go through their liturgy. So moving on. Then we have the Latin, the medieval period where they spoke Latin. We have several hymns from this time period, and we, we sing one of them more often than the other. I'm going to get into this, but of course, these all had to be translated in English for us to use them. And I want you to think about that. These were written in Latin, but someone centuries later had to take these and put them in meter and poetry and rhyme them and put them in melody. All of this took place over many, many years of time. Moving on to German Reformation, this is when everything changed, and church historians would tell you that, and it also changed our hymnody. And this, to me, is really the beginning of our English-speaking hymnody, because this is when things changed so much. So what's our most famous hymn? Martin Luther's A Mighty Fortress is Our God. We actually have two more. Um, if you know, Praise the Lord the Almighty, we sing that a lot, and Now Thank We All Our God. All the, both of those are from that time period as well. So. Here's, I'm getting ahead of myself, and it's easy to do this with slides and notes in front of you. So, <clears throat> following the Reformation, this is when Protestant beliefs 
were, became divisive, to be honest with you. Um, and we have the belief at that point, and John Wesley was teaching this, that psalmody was the only way to sing. And so there were obviously divisions and Protestant beliefs, and I, I highlighted the word psalter because that's really the first psalter that was hymnal, and we think of it as a hymnal, but this was their collection of song. The first one that was brought to the U.S. was in Pennsylvania, and actually some Amish people start, still use um, psalters to this day in 1564, so that was technically the first one. But the first general one that was used in the U.S. Is, was brought in the Mayflower with the pilgrims, and the British brought the first English psalter to Jamestown, a collection of psalms. This is what they sang, and it had to be translated in English at, it, from the Brits, and they brought it to... Um, to the U.S. And so with the invention of the printing press, I want you to think about all the technological advances as those things happened. They made more liberties for more song periods, and this is what happened. The Bay Psalm book was printed for the first time in the U.S. in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1640. So this is the first collection in the U.S. after so much had happened in England. So we're going to kind of go move forward from 1640, but we're still in England, okay? So I wanted to give you a little bit of that at least. So this is the first man, Benjamin Keach, 1640. Not a real happy guy, <laughs> but you'll know why when I tell you. He became a Christian at 15 and a Baptist preacher at age 18. He pastored a little church called Keach's Meeting House. This is our group, and if I wish I could tell you more. I, I, would, I would be here for hours. I told Pastor Sean this could go on forever. And I won't do that to you, but the English preserve buildings there like the Americans don't. It's really amazing. And this particular building, I, I took a picture of the entryway, which is on the one side, and then our group is on the front of the house, standing just like it was in the 1600s. Um, and this is in 1658. He was 18 when he pastored this church. He called the meeting house. And it still remains in Winslow, in England, just as it was then. And in fact, it wasn't even dusty in there. I mean, it smelled like mildew and a little wood, but it was just really, really neat. So here we are, we're, we're touring through this building. It looked like, if you've ever been to Crossroads Village, you know, some of those little tiny um, buildings that were all wood and just felt feel very small, that's kind of what it feels like. Pews are very hard, very small. I honestly think the human body must have been smaller at that time because buildings just felt very, very small to me. So we walked through this building and thought, this is what this man did. He, is, um, he wrote catechisms, and he was the first one to write hymns at a time when only psalmody was allowed. So he's writing hymns, not very good. They weren't sal salvageable, um, really not really singable, but his position on on believing that the church needed psalm or songs of human composure, that's what we call them, um, was his stance, and he was criticized for it. In fact, he was persecuted. He was imprisoned several times. He was mocked publicly and heavily fined for his position on him singing. And so um, he really is believed to be the first person that, that entered or that fought, really, for him singing in churches. So the plaque above his pulpit I kind of, I like this. It, it says Benjamin Keach. He's the pastor of the Baptist Church assembling in this place from 1660 to 1668 who restored congregational singing of hymns as a part of divine worship and suffered in prison and the pillory here at Aylesbury in October of 1664 for asserting the right of liberty of conscience and bearing witness to the sovereignty of Christ. So his position really paved the way to sing doctrinal truth written by human beings at that time. Moving on to Thomas Ken. So this, they're getting a little happier if you notice. <laughs> Thomas was orphaned in childhood, raised by his older sister. He was an Anglican bishop and he studied at Winchester College and he stayed there as a teacher and mentored his students. He wrote prayers for them to sing it morning and evening and the morning hymn was entitled, Awake My Soul which is reasonable, but this evening hymn was entitled, music teachers might recognize this, All Praise to Thee, My God, This Night. And at the end of each prayer, they would sing a song. And his song that he wrote have become the most sung sacred English words across the globe. He pastored a little church. It's really not that little. It's actually very beautiful. Uh, the this is his, and typically preachers are, are 
buried outside their church buildings. So this was another thing where we would stop at a church and then their tombs were right, right there outside the door. Um, but he wrote this prayer for his students, and so we will sing it. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him. Okay, now we're moving to the 18th century with two people you might be familiar with, John and Charles Wesley. They're brothers about four years apart. There are two brothers in a family of 19 children. 11 of the children survived and nine died, or eight, I'm sorry, my math is wrong, eight died as infants. So the parents are the famous Susanna Wesley, we've heard a lot of stories of Susanna, and Samuel Wesley, who is an Anglican clergy and a drunkard. Very difficult life, difficult marriage, difficult home. Their house burned down twice, and at one point, Samuel actually left her and the children. These are stories you probably don't like to hear or comfortable to hear, but I, I, to me, this put people in context. They were human beings in very hard situations, often in their homes. So John and Charles go to Oxford. They're unsaved. They get involved in social justice reform, and this is kind of their, their, their place of where they like to sit and discuss, and, and we, there were different places and we took pictures. So they form what's called, and this is probably a mockery of a, of a title, the Holy Club, and this is what people th thought of them as, but it was really to kind of tease them. And this was the place where they actually sat and talked about all the places of life that they were gonna change and they were gonna just reform the world. So they meet and discuss issues they want to impact, and then they're invited to the U.S., and during their travels on a ship, the storm arose, and Moravians on the ship show a firm trust in God in the middle of the storm, and it impressed them, Charles especially. So this was the seed that was planted a little bit more in his life. They go to the U.S., John stays there, and then Charles goes back home to England and lands in a church in Bristol. And this was the church... Um, I, I actually texted a friend as we were walking through this. It was so poignant to me because I, I can, you can picture a recently saved college grad. This is Charles Wesley. He's probably 22, 23. He comes back to Bristol. He accepts, um, he accepts the Lord somewhere in this timeline, and I haven't ever really gotten all of it, but he was a clear believer. And this is the church he's being discipled in. And he be, eventually is a part of the pastoral clergy there, but this is where he starts writing his hymns. And part of this is because he's being discipled, he's reading the Bible, he's studying scripture. And so he is, um, he's preaching and, uh, as well. And I took a picture of this. I, I thought this was really kind of neat. They have two pulpits in this church. This wasn't common at the time, but again, this church is preserved just like it was in the, in the 1700s. They had two pulpits. The preaching of the word was the one at the top, and the reading of scripture and leading of songs was the one at the bottom. So they really prioritized in their minds this was setting apart the word of God and when it was preached. So Charles hears... George Whitfield's preaching in Bristol, another name you would know, understands salvation, he's being discipled, he realizes more of the wonder of God, and the church is beginning to grow, and not many hymns are written, clearly, but he starts writing in them anyway, and this is what he pens. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hark the herald angels sing. Come thou long expected Jesus. Love divine, all loves excelling. Jesus lover of my soul. Rejoice the Lord is king. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Come, thou almighty king. Now, he wrote hundreds of hymns, and I just wrote down eight. Those are the ones we sing the most often. But if you think back to some of your childhood catechisms, if I can say it, the doctrine that we learned, so much of it was learned in these hymns right here. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hark the herald angels sing. I mean, there, were, there was so much doctrine, and I thought he knew his Bible, and it came out in his pen, and this is what he penned. But the one that moves me the most, yes, 
and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? I honestly can't say that song text without being moved to tears. Because when he says, bold, I approach the eternal throne. Because as a believer, he knew his salvation. So that's the first one we'll sing, and I'll play it for you. And can it be? Moving on now to a man, another man uh, you would recognize, Isaac Watts. I'm getting lost in my notes here. Okay, so he's a few hundred miles away from the Wesleys at another place called Northampton. This is where the Titanic set sail from, if you would know that story. He is now known as the father of hymnody, which actually it's because of his writing that he does, but he wasn't the first, clearly the first hymn writer, but he's, because of his writing was so epic. He was always articulate. He was, um, as a child, he was, he had um, kind of bold and massive writing ideas. And because of the, the words he used, um, he, he just was known as a good writer. And so I, I thought about that, actually, as I made a list of all of his hymns, he has bold opening lines, and they go like this. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. I mean, you think about it. These were big words, and he's putting them into song. Oh, God, our help in ages past. I sing the mighty power of God. I mean, all of these were kind of big words, and they're really moving. But ironically, his powerful writing was very different from his physical stature. He was known to be feeble and sickly. He was five feet tall, and he's described as having a hooked nose and scrawny eyes. The story is this, that one point in his life, he began to, writing to a woman he'd had contact with but never met in person. She fell in love with the beauty of his writing, and so he proposed to her in a letter, and she comes to meet him and rejected him because of his physical appearance. I know, isn't that sad? It is. And the story is he never married because of a broken heart. So... This is Isaac Watts. I know, now you think of him a little differently, don't you? But he continued to write other subjects, and I think this is part because he was just such a writer at heart, of astronomy, grammar, psychology, and logic. So clearly a very brilliant man. And he lived most of his life in Southampton where his monument stands in a park here. Um, and I, I, this is really all we have of Isaac Watts. It was just a monument where he lived and then I can show you where uh, he's buried, but it, it, there wasn't just, you know, chasing dead people, you're not gonna meet the people, you just have to find, but I actually, I did think about, I know that's very profound, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, well, you know what I mean. I mean, as much as you can meet someone, you have to find where they lived and just find different things about them. So, but I really did think of this, it was really neat. Oh, I wanna go back. Um, that you can't see it, obviously, but what's inscripted on that monument there says, ages unborn shall make his songs the joy and labor of their tongues. And I thought that was really neat. It just was kind of this prophetic statement of, they were right. For centuries, people will sing amazing songs that he wrote. 
And I picked my favorite because I think we sing it so well as a church. And, and his writing really is, this to me is probably one of the most personal hymns he wrote. So here's When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And we'll sing two stanzas of this one. Okay, now we shift our focus to a little bit later, and a lot of these were contemporary. So this is about maybe 25 years later, and these are obviously the birth dates, so you can see their, their timeline. And I want to also insert that I, I put their whole, obviously their whole lifespan for you, but a lot of this work happened in the middle of these years, if you can think about it that way, a lot when they were about 30 years old. So we're talking now about 1760. But these are names you would recognize, I'm sure. So here's another part of England to a young man named William Cooper. Cooper's mother died when he was six, and he was sent to a boarding school where he was teased and bullied. His dad wanted to become him to become a respected attorney, so William began his education in law but had a panic attack during his bar exam and failed it. And from that point on, he really suffered anxiety and depression. So by age 28, he'd even attempted suicide three times. So this tells you where he was most of his life. He befriended the kids of the Unwin family, and some of you might know this story, who eventually took him in to live with him, live with them. And eventually er, the, the kids moved out and the father died in a riding accident in his 30s. And so there's William staying with the widow Mary. So it's kind of awkward a little bit. She's only about nine years older than him, and so they were kind of stuck. What are they going to do? So here comes a man named John Newton, and he hears this story. He's a pastor in Olney, and he hears of this family and their loss, and he had lost his mother when he was six, but he's always moved by his salvation because we know his testimony and as, as he is authored in the hymn, Amazing Grace. Good. So people then knew him as one of the happiest, healthiest pastors of the 18th century. So John invites them to come to his town and be a part of his church. And this is where he befriends William. And for 13 years, Newton was Cooper's pastor, his counselor, and his friend. So Newton challenges Cooper to write. And, and he notices there's, there's quite a depression with Cooper. And he gives him this job to do. And in fact, the story is we, we went through, um, I should go forward so I can show you. This is where he invites Cooper to come and live. He, he gets him a place to live, and this is the house. It's a half museum now, and it's kind of an apartment building too, but there's a plaque on the wall that says William Cooper, and he lived here. And he lived in the, in the second story, and Mary lived in another story. So there was kind of another, there's a division between the two of them, and that was Newton's um, plan. 
And behind the house, this is where it really is hit home for me. So there is beautiful gardens. England is filled with lush greenery. It's very beautiful. But there's a little house that was built just for William Cooper to write. And I, it kind of is like a big dog house. It, that's about the size. But for him, this was his little place, his little abode where he wrote hymns. And it was called Cooper's Summer House. Isn't that sweet? So, and you can see, you can't really get into it. Um, it it's, it's a little broken down now, and it, it's just, it's precious to think of all the, the hymns that he wrote that happened in a little doghouse. I mean, it was just nothing really that special. But this is where Newton made a place for him, and so this is what he did. So, this is Newton's church in Olney, which is... Um, a little bit, maybe it's about, we walked about a mile away from that little place of Cooper's little doghouse. <laughs> and so this was his church, and we sang Amazing Grace in it, of course. Um, and I, I just thought that was really neat that, that Newton, he not only invited him into his church, he invited in, him into his life in a massive way. And that's, that comes with a lot of baggage, really, if I can say it. So he said to him, Cooper, if William, if you will write a poem for every sermon, that will kind of give a collection of things going. And he kind of got him on a job. And eventually, they compiled a hymnal, which is called Only Hymns. So in it, of course, there are hymns that we know. And so in honor of both of these men, we're going to sing two hymns. The first one being, There is a Fountain. And I would tell you, most of Cooper's hymns we, we don't sing anymore. The, the one I wish we did, there's not a, not a whole lot of good tunes for it. God moves in, in a mysterious way. But There is a Fountain Filled with Blood is probably his most famous. And then in honor of John Newton, we'll sing Amazing Grace. So here we go. Oh, I did want to say this one thing. <laughs> this is John Newton's, um, yeah, his... his um, cemetery, I mean, his, not, his gravestone, and he's, he's buried outside the church. He was actually first buried in London, and when they redid all the um, transportation system and the subway, and, the, and they had to move his, his grave, they moved it back to only where he was um, originally a pastor there. But I did want to read this for you, because this is where it was really neat. It says on that, you can't see it, it's really in the small font, but it says, John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. He knew his salvation. I just love that. So in honor of both of those men, we'll sing, There is a Fountain and Amazing Grace.
year now is 1740, and Augustus, oh, I meant to say Augustus. <laughs> Picture a U and S at the end of that. Sorry about that. Augustus' top lady is born, and he becomes a, Christ, a Christian as a freshman at Trinity College in Dublin and grew under the teaching of John Wesley. And he begins serving as an Anglican cleric. So John Wesley at this point is teaching a very strong Arminian belief that a Christian could work out their own salvation and eventually achieve perfection if committed fully to abstaining from sin. That should make you a little uncomfortable. Top Lady studied John 17, though, and I, this is what I, the part of the story that I focus on is it drove him back to his Bible to see if it was true or not. And God's rescue of a fallen, undeserving, wayward-driven sinner it is very prominent in his mind as, as, a, result, as a result of John of studying John 17. He becomes convinced that a man is headed for God's wrath unless Christ washes him with his blood and imputes righteousness in him. So he grows concerned with Wesley's teaching, but here's another very interesting part of the story. He didn't start a crusade or a campaign against Wesley or stir, or stir loud debates on Calvinism, but he wrote this, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Does that make sense to you now? When you think of that hymn, you understand why he wrote that. So he was really correcting what he, what he felt at the time was wrong theology. He wrote other hymns as well. I think this is probably one of his most famous because it's here that he stated his own personal theology. There's a location that inspired this hymn, um, and this was probably one of the most, I took a panoramic, you can't really see it very well, but this is where the fork in the road happens. And the story is, and this is, could be folklore, we don't know, but um, I choose to believe it because it's a really neat story. <laughs> he was apparently uh, it would, uh, traveling through this very place, and during a thunderstorm, he hid inside this rock right here where there's a cleft in the middle of it. And so this was kind of his, his vision for this hymn. And so in his mind, he thought of this as the rock of ages. This is in Burrington Combe. If you've ever traveled through, it's kind of a main highway, but um, it was very cold that day, but you can see it was beautiful. So here's rock of ages. We'll sing two stanzas. Do you need to stand? Would that help you? I think we need to stand. Why don't you stand? Yes, rock of ages. Here we go. <clears throat> be seated. Thank you. Okay, a few more to go here. This is a man named John Mason Neal. Has anyone heard of John Mason Neal? I didn't think so. Yeah. Here is Neal. This is very profound to me. He is very unknown in any hymnal. He's the behind the scenes guy. He wasn't a gifted speaker. He wasn't a visionary leader. He wasn't a pastor but he knew his Bible, and he felt he was seeing compromise in the time. And so, and again, instead of, instead of starting a crusade or speak against a brother in Christ, as he thought he was seeing at the time, 
he began to interpret and form words into poetry, and he needed a desk. And I, I don't know how many, let's see. Um, okay, I will show you this in a minute. This is his, his gravestone. It was very un, kind of unseen at the back of a lot. Again, this is just very representative of his life. He really didn't have a name, but this is what he did. He took hymns that were written in the previous centuries, Latin, like I told you with the, the all creatures and the, the Latin and the medieval periods, and he translated them into English, thousands of them. And at the bottom of a hymnal, you'll see trans period JMN, and that's his identity. He did really nothing but that, as he just translated hymns of, of another man's work. And so he's not very well known. He's not a Wesley or a Watts, and he won't be named in the, hall, the Hymnal Hall of Fame. But because of him, we have O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, All Glory, Laud, and Honor, and Good Christian Men Rejoice, among thousands of others. I think that was kind of striking to me, too. You know, I, I, a lot of times now you see hymn writers, and in our day we see maybe five or six hymn writers on one hymn. It's, 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 we, we live in a different day. But in all of those hymns, you can, you, there's probably one voice that's a little bit louder than the others, and there's probably one guy who said, I think maybe we should change that to an E flat or an F. This was this guy. He was the guy that just kind of was behind the scenes. In fact, his job, this was interesting to me, he needed a place to write. Writers do. I have a little cave back there. It doesn't, it's just, you kind of have to hole up sometimes when you write, and this was his job. It, it, it was a, originally Sackville College, and co the college building was turned into a, a retirement home, <laughs> and they needed a place, uh, a person to take care of these retirees and retired clergy, and so he had an office there, and that's where he wrote. He wrote his hymns that were basically an, a rewrite of another man's work. So this is trans JMN, okay? He's a nobody. But because of him, we have these, hymn, we have these hymns. And I, again, I want you to know, translating is one thing, but putting it into meter and crafting it into melody and song is a whole other story. It's quite a big job. So I, I thought about what hymn I would have you sing with this. And because this is probably my favorite because of the doctrinal truth, I'm going to play this one for you. This is Of the Father's Love Begotten. We have so much doctrine that originated in this hymn, and I'm going to play it for you because we don't know it as well. So this is just one stanza of Of the Father's Love Begotten. We'll finish with um, another name you'll probably recognize as well. This is a young woman in Worcestershire. It is really Worcestershire. In 1836, she is the youngest child born to Jane and William Havergal, who is a gifted preacher, pastor, and accomplished musician. So their daughter, Frances, grows up and serves in her dad's church her whole life, and her mother dies at age 12. Her dad married a young woman that Frances struggled with, remarried, and so she went to live with her sister and family for the next uh, seven years, and when her father grew ill, she came back home and took care of her dad and stepmother until they died. 
She grieved over her mother's death and other losses in her family, and she wrote this in her journal. Oh, here's her church. I should have showed you this. Um, again, another beautiful church building, the, the front of it, and, um, and this, is the, well, this was really her dad's church, but she served here in this church building her whole life. But this was what she wrote in her journal. Even in very painful spiritual darkness, it has comforted me to think that God might be leading me through strange dark ways so that I might be his messenger to some of his children in distress. I kind of thought that just put a cap on suffering so often. So she's buried just like a lot of church leaders. She's buried right next to her dad, and um, she never married, but she had, um, and she died at age 42. So, and a lot of these lifespans were very short. You know, medical technology was not as advanced, and they just didn't live as long of lifespans, but they accomplished so much in this short time. But on her gravestone, it says, by her writings and prose and verse, she being dead yet speaketh. I love that because it just it just says she kind of lives on in her song and her words. It's just very beautiful. So we'll sing. This was um, probably the, the most well-known of hymns. Um, and she, let's see, I don't have another one. I do. Like a River Glorious is one she's written. And who is on the Lord's side? I, I, I love that, that, that text, not as much the tune. <laughs> But we do sing, Take My Life and Let It Be. So I thought we would sing this one. So this was two stanzas of Take My Life and Let It Be. So I'm going to give you a few final thoughts, and I know I'm really running short on time here, so stick with me, maybe five more minutes. So final thoughts, uh, these were, they're probably not original, definitely not original to me. I've, I've read many books on hymns and theology and worship. There's no end to those types of books. <clears throat> so this is probably a duplication of another man's thoughts, but these are just things I jotted down as I came away from this trip. First of all, I hope it's evident I'm not just showing you travel pictures and, and stories. Um, and this is really not, I, I guess, a hidden agenda to hope, you know, our church comes back to just singing old hymns. That's really not my heart here. But here's what I do want to convey, is that writers are human, and their lives are difficult and hard, and just like us, they had everyday trials. Loss, loneliness, failures, brotherly disagreements, and there were no shortages of those. Pain and suffering, and they were faithful in situations that likely felt impossible. They trusted God in their hardship, and often, especially in the case of Cooper and many others, their greatest struggle became the very vehicle that compelled their legacy. Their hardship was hidden behind the words that they wrote on the page. I thought of Cooper's life, and I just thought, well, where would we be without there is a fountain filled with blood? But underneath that was a man who was completely depressed and, and went up and down and up and down, and John Newton had to probably reel him back and talk him off the ledge. How often? Thank you, John Newton. 
But thank you, William Cooper, for having the faith to, to just write some words down and to use his gifts for the Lord. I also hope to convey something else, that these were not written by fundamental Baptists. They probably weren't men we would invite to speak in our church. They were different. They had different beliefs. They were Anglican, Methodist, chaplains, and bishops, completely different from our stripe, if you will. And God still had his hand on their writing to, use, to become what has shaped and informed our theology for centuries. So the lesson here to me is, you know, our, our hymns are friends through life. I mean, who hasn't grown up with some of these? Well, there is a fountain is just one. Amazing Grace has been quoted in how many movies and, you know, books. I mean, this is, these are hymns that the world knows. And they comfort us, they catechize us, they instill, and they articulate truths that we can't come up with ourselves. So often, I, I will tell you this, I play for most of the funerals in this church. And it amazes me, um, it kind of tells a little bit about the family when they pick the hymns that they want played during the, the final moments of when they're grieving their loss. And I cry right there with them, trust me. But I always praise the Lord when I think, yes, they, they picked a hymn that they know, whether it's, it is well with my soul, and there's another story that we could go on about, uh, maybe another day I could tell you about that one. To, um, what's the one we, Christ our hope in life and death. So anything from era to era, they, they pick these hymns to remind them of the truth of God. The most poignant one to me, this was a young man in our church who lost his mother, and he asked me to play A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And when he said that, I thought, what in the world? How am I going to play this at a funeral? <laughs> that is not a funeral song. And I thought, that's a funeral song because it reminds me of the truth of God as a fortress in a time when I just want to be sad. So what makes a good hymn? Have you ever thought about that? Hymns are chosen for you. Pastor Jim does a great job with that. But what makes them lasting? What makes them well-written? I'm going to also say, again, this is not my thoughts, but I, these are just things I jotted down as I was writing in a van. The first thing is accuracy of Scripture. So these men studied Scripture, and that's the first thing that I, they weren't just crafting something that they wanted to have as a poem or trying to make an income. They studied scripture and it was born out of their informed theology. Another thing is it was an equal blend of truth and beauty. Truth and beauty need each other. One without the other is either boring artistically or weak spiritually. They, they really need both. We need both in, the, in hymns. Beautiful and relevant language. I will tell you, I've already said, there's thousands of hymns I've neglected, and we just chose one out of someone's 25 that they, that they wrote. Why? Because some of them, they are, their language is, is easier to sing. It's maybe easier to understand. And so as we move forward now, and we're in 2024, our language is different. Our spoken language is different, so our hymns are going to be different. I think another one is a balance of doctrine and human experience. Isaac Watts said this well, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of, um, yeah, what did I say? When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died and I pour contempt on all my pride. He's, he's saying, I recognize what a sinner I am, but what a God I have. And there's kind of this balance of, of, of who God is and who I am too. And I think that's a good balance. And of course, just to have dynamic and being able, just powerful to sing. When we sing Power of the Cross or In Christ Alone, as we did this morning, I mean, the roof could come off. It's so beautiful. You just sing beautifully, by the way, and it's, it is a privilege to accompany you on a Sunday. It's the highlight of my week. And I just, I, I think it's, it's good to think what is making up, what's teaching our children the hymns that they sing and what makes them. So what compelled the authors to write these things? I only have three ideas, and I'll let you go. Conviction for the truth of God's word. As in the case of Augustus Toplady, he wrote because he knew there was a conviction of something he saw, an error in a teaching that he felt. And because he went back to John 17, he said, I think this is, this is my conviction and I'm writing it down. I'm not gonna, 
course, there was no social media, but he didn't stir social media campaigns, if you know, that, if there was that such a thing back then. He wrote it down, and then for centuries, we have sung his words. Devotion to serving God's people, um, I didn't, I, I feel like I'm hurried for time, and so I didn't really talk about Frances Havergal, but hers was really a devotion. And I didn't tell you the story, but before she wrote Take My Life and Let It Be, she became very convicted of her material possessions. And just like you can see in the hymn, she gave all away all of her jewelry, most of her clothing, anything she had, she gave it away because she felt like she couldn't do more for God. Those are the types of people that felt, I just want to give to God's people and give to God by giving to God's people. And that's what they did to write things down. And of course, the trust in God's leading through hardship. From Newton to Cooper, most of these people lost parents in their childhood. They lost spouses. They lost a lot. And they, they did with very little. And they trusted God. And they wrote hymns that have stood with us for the test of time. So here are my final thoughts to you. The hymnal is not inspired. And to be frank, like Pastor Jim said, a hymnal is really depreciating. The minute it's published, it's, it's going down because we're adding hymns immediately. They're, being, they're, they're cranking out as fast as the internet can pump them out. Praise the Lord for that, because just like I told you with the, with the invention of the printing press, we have the invention of the internet and with projection and so much other media, we have immediate hymns. And so Christi as Christians, we have everything to sing about. As a church, we have everything to sing about together. So here are my final thoughts. Sing to remind yourselves of who God is. Sing to encourage the brother and sister around you. When you sing, they're listening to you sing, and sometimes when they can't. Sing to proclaim what God has done for you. Sing to give back to God the joy and celebration of salvation that he's given you. Sing to prove not necessarily what you feel, but what you know to be true. Sing to exalt the God who saved you. With all our might, let's make much of God in our singing because he deserves it. Thank you, Molly. I thought uh, there were several lines in there that uh, just helped bring the song, the text, alive. And uh, I certainly hope, I realize you might have felt um, a little pressed by time, but we may just have to ask you to come back and do this from time to time on Sunday nights. And uh, I think it would be really, really enjoyable and helpful. And I think it would be an absolute shame after all of that for us not to close with some type of a traditional hymn. Pastor Jim, you have something in mind? Are we going to make Molly come right back up on the platform and play? I mean, after, uh, after that, we'll close. Uh, Pastor Jim will close in a word of prayer. And then, uh, again, just publicly, we appreciate uh, each of you, your contribution to the music ministry each week, and certainly uh, Molly and all that she does uh, to help us in that, Pastor Jim and so forth. Pastor Jim, you take it. Brian, we'll sing three verses of Like a River Glorious, and you're going to find out how good Brian is right here, too, all right? Let's stand and sing together, please. Like a
time. Thank you, Molly, and thank you, church family. I can say on behalf of Molly, on behalf of myself and all the musicians, what a privilege it is to be a part with the worshiping you every Sunday. Uh, Molly said it's the highlight of her week. It's certainly the highlight of my time of serving Christ is serving here with you each Sunday morning and evening. So thank you for being a blessing to others as you sing. You're a blessing to us. You're dismissed.